Hi, so first of all, just uh, let you know, so I'm not tindering here, but uh, my e-printer was broken, so <laughs> my notes uh, are actually in my phone. So, um, okay, so let's get started. So basically the, the whole um, panel is about uh, entrepreneurship today. And uh, so first I would like to do a little bit of a, you know, kind of a questionnaire here for the audience. So actually how many of you guys, hands, hands up, uh, are, you know, currently entrepreneurs? Okay, quite a few. And how about, uh, how many are you uh, are working in startups? Okay, a little bit more than that. Okay, and who is actually looking at or, you know, interested in starting a, starting a business? Okay, seems pretty good, yeah. So, um, so let's get cracking. So we have about 30 minutes, and um, so we have four panelists. And I'm, let's just uh, do a quick intro uh, for each and every one. So actually, I'm pretty excited to be in this panel and moderating this because I'm <laughs> this is uh, really, really exciting. I mean, everybody here is a trailblazer um, and, um, uh, in entrepreneurship. So basically, let's start with uh, Dr. Virginia Cha. So uh, just a quick... Um, so she has been um, co-founder and CEO of multiple venture-funded high-tech companies in Singapore and China with successful exits in both NASDAQ and uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Currently adjunct professor at Entrepreneurship INSEAD and uh, Virginia is an active researcher, educator, mentor and angel investor in Singapore's uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem after 30 years at executive management in technology companies. Is that more or less? Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> Summarized correctly. <laughs> Thank yeah. You. Okay. So, could you just like uh, quickly, uh, you know, share with the audience, like, you know, what is kind of currently like, uh, what's your normal week week oh, like? Okay. Well, firstly, that picture looks nothing like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I decided uh, recently to go authentic and let my hair go gray. So, um, but with streaks of purple, just just to make it interesting. What's my typical week like? Um, first of all, I want to share with you that I used to be a programmer many years ago. I have a computer science undergraduate degree. Um, got that in the 1970s, back in those days where um, there are very few women um, in the engineering school. So I was uh, one of the few, uh, maybe the only one or two. But I never noticed us. I was such a geek. I didn't know there were you know, men and women, because I saw people as ones and zeros. Um, <laughs> Anyway, the question is, what do I do in a typical week? So in a typical week, I um, meet with entrepreneurs, either entrepreneurs who come to see me uh, about to start a business or entrepreneurs who are in the business and uh, want to get some advice um, because it's really lonely to be an entrepreneur. I, you know, you see all these media reports about how glamorous it is to be an entrepreneur. Well, that's totally not true. So if you want to... Uh, uh, want to have a glamorous life uh, or make lots of money, be a banker, all right? Um, <laughs> so that's, that's how I spend my typical week. And I also teach. Uh, I, I, in fact, recently I just finished teaching a class in uh, a module at INSEAD, where, which is very interesting for you. We partner the MBA students with uh, coders, uh, programmers, um, so that they can come together and learn to build a, a solution to a a problem together in the span of about two weeks. And the amazing part of that is, and, and this you should take note, because when you're engineering trained or if you're a programmer, which I assume many of you in the audience are, um, you're trained differently. You are very left brain, all right? And, and people process you differently because not only are you left brain, you're a woman. And so people expect you not to be left brain, okay? Um, so you're going to have to kind of deal with that kind of, you know, cognitive dissonance throughout life. Um, but it's okay. Look at me. I'm still standing or sitting, actually. Um, but anyway, it was very interesting because um, when the MBAs and the programmers got together, it wasn't all just learning about how to code and go to market. It's also about learning how business-minded people, MBAs, and engineers uh, come together and be able to communicate so that you can build a solution that's technical, technical in nature together. And I think that skill uh, and the ability to do that, to cross-communicate between business and uh, technical minds, uh, is going to be an increasing important skill to have. So I would encourage all of you in the audience who are um, coding or learning to code, 
to sort of also pay attention to developing that communication skill. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, continuing uh, the, also the introduction, so then we have also um, so Lim Ching Ru. And uh, so you're actually a poster, uh, so you're kind of like a poster child and a role model for entrepreneurs here in uh, Singapore because uh, so you basically, which is very interesting to me, is that you actually studied uh, philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so then you went on to build uh, and co-found Zopim and then uh, that was uh, a global live chat, uh, is a global live chat, uh, you know, um, software as a service startup and that was acquired by Nasdaq listed uh, Zendesk for over uh, US 30 million in 2014 and then so uh, so can you just uh, share a little bit uh, kind of like what happened, what, what has been happening uh, after that and, uh, and uh, basically how, how's your normal <laughs> week nowadays? Right, it's hard to guess that I'm actually the person in the uh, second picture. <laughs> <laughs> I've put on uh, a good, I think 15 kg since then, uh, two years, in the last two years. Um, yeah, so I don't look like a poster girl. Uh, I definitely don't think that, um, yeah, like I totally don't look like a type. Um, but I guess, I guess one thing good about um, being an entrepreneur is that uh, you start seeing things very differently and even now in my current state what I'm doing right now, I'm a mom and I see my kid as a new startup, right? Except that it's a startup <laughs> that doesn't really, you know, only ends up in an acquisition that loses you money. Um, <laughs> you, have a, you have a very solid launch date, like nine months and it's out kind of ish, plus minus only one, two days, whereas in product launches, sometimes can take like difference like a few months, right? Um, so, so yeah, this, that's kind of what I'm working on right now. Um, I just gave birth, so it, it, it is kind of a struggle. Um, and ironically, before, before I gave birth, like just six months before, I was giving a talk at a, at a career women's um, uh, group um, event, and I think Virginia was there, right? and she could call my bluff. <laughs> Because what happened then, I was, I, was, I was highlighting to everyone, you know, um, only 10% of all women in, 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 uh, in, in local Singapore direct, uh, uh, directorship are women, and only like a quarter of women, uh, people in parliament are women, so like all of us should actually step up and enter the workforce even when we have a family. But now when I have my own kid, I realize how hard it is. It's I struggled through the first few months of uh, motherhood. So yeah, I think, uh, to be honest, I definitely want to be going back to the startup scene again. I think it's really exciting. Uh, but yeah, right now, yeah, that's, that's kind of uh, taking out like 150% of my time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then, uh, so then we have uh, Anna Hotanto, and so she's the CEO and founder of The New Savvy and director at Terra Capital, a private investment firm. So uh, you have been nominated and selected for Fortune Most Powerful Women Conference in 2016 and 2015, right? Yeah. San Fran? No? Yeah. And then, uh, so... Um, but you started in uh, banking and finance, right? Yeah, yes. yeah. So, like, how, how is your how is your uh, typical week or so day in the office? So, like, what professor said when I was in school, all I wanted was to earn money because my family had some financial difficulties. So, I started in banking. I was in investment banking, private equity, and moved on to wealth management. I was there for ten over years, and. And I was, um, I was doing very well. I was one of the top private bankers. And one day, I just decided that I was very unhappy. Um, I wanted to help others. I wanted to make an impact. And I thought to myself, what, what can I do? Um, and the only way I thought was uh, is through finance, because that's the only thing I know. So for 10 over years, even in school, I, all I did was really study finance. And, and when I came out, I, I, did, I didn't start the new survey. So the new survey is an online platform for women. We focus on financial and career education. Um, it's all free, uh, online resource. Uh, I started it not as a business. I started it because I feel that, you know, uh, there are others in my situation. I felt that financial education is lacking in Singapore, in Asia, and there was no media, there was no resource available for women to focus on their finances. Because if you look at finance media, it's either uh, Bloomberg, Yahoo Finance, uh, Reuters, or you have financial blocks that are very technical, so they tell you how to analyze the stocks, you know, how do you do the valuation. Or the, the last one is the scammy claim that, that tell you, you know, I sit down at my house and I earn 100,000 in 10 days. 
So, uh, yeah, there was nothing that speaks to women. And I think women look at finances very differently from men. Um, I'm sorry, there are a few men here, but um, men tend to be very overconfident, so they trade a lot and they spend um, a lot of their time. If you ask a man what, what kind of return they want out of their investments, uh, and I see two of you there, uh, a lot of men will tell you 20%. If you ask a woman what kind of return she wants, it will be about 6 to 12%. So, so that's why I started it. It grew and from then I got involved in, um, in the FinTech Association. So I hate the Women in FinTech and Partnership Committee. The idea was to actually raise awareness and to promote the women in FinTech because, um, again, women in tech is very underrepresented. Women in finance is very, very underrepre is underrepresented. And women in FinTech is the worst. Like, there's only 12% of women in FinTech. So that was why it was started. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and some good data points there. Um, so, and then we have uh, Anne-Marie Drost. And uh, so, uh, so she's a director at Entrepreneur First, um, uh, which is the world's leading company builder. And so you invest in top technical individuals to help them uh, build world-class deep technology startups from scratch. In, in, uh, and first you were in London, now in Singapore. And you had the first cohort out, out this year, no? Yeah. And uh, uh, interesting thing also, I have to mention that you actually um, you opened up this uh, travel business in North Korea, which is interesting point. <laughs> so uh, how's your <laughs> typical week? Well, given the recent North Korea news, I'm very glad that I des decided to like, slightly diversify my career. Um, no, you're right though. I, uh, so my background's in physics, um, so I was also very technically trained. And then um, I graduated and went into finance because that's what sellouts do, right? Um, I lasted for seven months until I decided this is absolutely terrible. Um, I quit and I started a travel agency to North Korea, which was not necessarily the world's most informed decision or best idea. Um, my day job at the moment, though, is I've probably got the best job in the world. Um, I work as an investor, so I give money to people who want to start startups. Um, but a slightly unusual investor. So in Singapore, I run this company called Entrepreneur First. And effectively, what we do, unlike other investors, is that we invest in individuals before they have teams and before they have ideas. That sounds kind of crazy because, yes, we literally pay you a salary to sit in a room and think of things that you might want to start. Um, but by now, we've done this with over 500 people. Um, we've built more than 100 companies. The portfolio is worth a billion. Uh, we've done loads of exits. Um, so the model works. And I think the trick to making the model work is two things. One is um, the quality of the individuals you invest in. By now, we can get like effectively whomever we want. So think of me almost as a headhunter. That's interesting because that means I can actively headhunt for women. I'll get back to that in a bit. <laughs> Second reason why it works is because the type of individuals that we take, so we work with um, nearly just technical individuals. Um, about 50% of the people I worked with in Singapore over the past year has a PhD in either computer science or engineering. That means that the type of companies that we build are more um, defensible because of the technology that they're built on than necessarily the market they operate in. It's not entirely true. Um, broadly speaking, we do very little like apps or marketplaces or e-commerce things, and we do a ton of like machine learning, artificial intelligence, space, quantum, um, and that creates a whole new class of companies, especially in this region. So yeah, so actually that, uh, going to that, so I have a f uh, question for you, which is that, you know, because you work, uh, you know, as a director there and uh, as an investor, right? And you mainly focus on technically uh, or scientifically talented individuals uh, and you basically build companies around them, right? So the thing is, like, so for this audience, so what kind of characteristics or patterns do you look for in successful potential founders? And uh, how could this relate as an advice to the audience members looking to start a career in tech? Yeah, um, so I think there's roughly two things that we look for. Um, one is, do you want to do this? As in, the only way to start a company is to actually start a company. And I think 
the easiest way to find out if you're a founder or not is whether or not you are willing to like make the sacrifices that are needed to do that. As in, I'm not going to lie, it's not like a fun job. It's not, um, I know I heard it before, going to finance if you think that you want to get really rich. As in, there has to be something in you that says this is not enough and I want to have like a bigger lever on whatever the world is going to in the next 50 years that makes you get up at 2 a.m. and do the last bug. I was going to swear and I didn't. Um, <laughs> And the second thing we look for is this thing called edge. Um, and edge basically means competitive advantage. So we don't select you on your ideas, but we do select you on the stuff that you've done in the past. As in um, hearing you say, oh, uh, yeah, I had to start a fintech or financial services related company because that was all I'd been doing for the past 10 years, almost as an excuse. We would specifically look for that. As in, um, one of the most common things that we see at AF is once we select what we call a cohort, which is about 100 people, um, we have all these amazing people who have, say, whatever, um, a PhD in computer vision. And then when you ask them, oh, what, what do you want to do? They'll say, I think I really want to start a food delivery company. <laughs> and I'm obviously not trying to pretend that there's no great food delivery companies, because there is. Um, but if you've never worked in that field, then you're probably unaware of whatever the problems in that field might, may be. Um, and A, it seems like a great idea because you're unaware of what might go wrong. Um, but two, the things that you have actually worked on seem really daunting and hard because you know exactly where the pain points are. But that's where it gets interesting. So we look for people who want to work on what they know. Okay. Thanks. And uh, so, and continuing, with that is actually, I would like to transfer the mic to um, uh, to um, talk about uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so to talk about um, uh, basically the uh, your uh, experience with uh, zoping, right? Because so the thing is that like hard work is a prerequisite of success, right? Um, and you know you also need luck as well, um, but you know. Um, so the timing has to be right, you know, all the stars have to be aligned, you know, in order um, to succeed and like, especially when you build a, you know, successful exit. But so um, what kind of like, um, you know, you deciding and like making a change in direction you're taking during this, during this time and this process. So where did you go right, uh, you know, during your trip? Where did you go wrong? Um, and, you know, are there some, you know, moments there and like how to know when it's time to quit uh, the grit or to just pivot. So basically, like, how do you know that you're kind of like in the right path as an entrepreneur? Okay. Um, so, you know, quitting and pivoting are like two different things. So let's talk about quitting. Um, the fact that I'm sitting here means that I didn't quit. Uh, but to be honest, there were a lot of challenges and um, there were times where I just, you know, I felt like quitting, right? It's a real thought that crosses your mind. Um, and these are really down times. So, Take for example, uh, every half a year when we were, we were a much smaller team, the founders would sit together uh, in a like marathon review session. We would like lock each other up in a room for like 16 hours straight, and we would give each other like feedback on how we're doing. Uh, and I remember there was like this very specific session when uh, my founders just came up and said like, "Hey, you know, I don't think you're pulling your weight." You know, you're not doing all these viral campaigns. And at the time in 2008, you talk about viral, we're talking about like Twitter campaigns that can generate like a million followers overnight. And you're like, you're not doing any of that, you know. Uh, and honestly, at that time, um, you just feel, at those times, you just feel like you're not good enough. You know, you're never good enough uh, that you suck. And, and that kind of feeling is, is huge when you think about that specific part of the business really, you know, it's a part of business that depends on you, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, I would say that it wasn't easy for me, uh, but um, quitting wasn't an option on the table. So, I, I mean, at that, at that point in time, I thought to myself, right, if I really, I really quit uh, and took the easy way out, the next time I have another obstacle coming my way, you know, quitting would be like the default option and it would be a vicious cycle. I constantly reinforcing myself that I was never good enough 
that uh, I could never rise above these challenges. So I decided to kind of take a slightly different, different approach. Instead of thinking that I wasn't good enough, I think that the feedback was directed more at my work than myself personally, and I kind of moved on from that. Uh, so luckily, th this was the only session that I had when I felt really bad. Um, and I just want to say that if you don't allow yourself to quit, and if you're always on your last frontier, and you always allow yourself to not think of this feedback as being directed personally at, at yourself, but like at your work, uh, it will be a lot easier to deal with. Um, pivoting wise, I think Zopin pivoted like a few times. Um, and it isn't like a single thing that just happens. Uh, usually there's a series of events that lead to it. And for us, uh, it started with this sudden moment in 2008, right? Uh, back then, we were, we were young, was this small fry, no one knew about us, was some roadshow trying to sell our services. Um, and this big global bank came up to us and they were like, hey, you know, your stuff's cool, I really want to use, use you guys. So that was like a super big deal for us because they were one of our first customers. Um, and we just, you know, went full steam into that project. Um, so one thing led to another and things got really painful real quick. Like, we were a cloud-based solution and they wanted us to host our stuff in their servers. Okay, so we, we did that. Um, there were a lot of mumbo jumbo to do, right? And it got to a point that it was so painful because we would have to kind of write Linux, email Linux commands to their service team. And they were like, you know, they will be based in India. So they, they would only come back to us the next day with all the error, error, error logs. And then we had to kind of like, okay, troubleshoot and find out what's, what's happening. So like that whole process was just so, so tedious that um, we were like, this is just not going to work. Um, I think at the end of the day, your customers can give you feedback. You know, your data can tell you some stuff about you know, how your business is doing. You know. uh, but really, instinctively, there's this feeling that's deep down inside you that says like, shit, you know, this is not going to work. You just have to pivot. So yeah, so that happened for us. Um, and we never looked back. We never, we never served big corporates from then on. We only went after small, medium enterprises. Just went online and scaled the business. So yeah, that's pivoting for us. And just like a small uh, follow-up question there. So once you actually, you know, exited, um, and the company was acquired, what was the, what was the feeling then? Just in few words. <laughs> like, yeah, is it is it relief or is it kind of like, oh no, what did I do? Um, there wasn't like a single feeling when we knew that we were a potential acquisition target. That it wasn't an excitement like, oh, we're gonna make millions of millions of dollars, but it was more of like. Are we really going to sell the company? We spent eight, nine years of our lives building this. The company is doing really great. Um, these other companies equally great too, if not better. Uh, they, have, they can articulate the vision that we had in our heads. They could put it in really nice PowerPoint slides and sell it really well. Like, whoa, you know, we're of a single mind, except that uh, you can, you know, I, I think they were like a thousand man team and, and they were already making a lot more money than us. Um, I would say, I would say excitement wasn't the word to describe it until like three, four months later, you know, when we really see that the company could jive and work together because acquisition in itself is, uh, it's a really tricky thing because you're really trying to figure each other out. You know, you don't know each other at all, you're trying to figure each other out. Um, and you're trying to find out what's going to happen from then on. And you really don't know. So if there's a word for it. I would say it's intense because that's really the, the, the three months, you know, we took three months, it, it took us just three months to get acquired, so it was a really intense journey. And then we go to uh, Virginia, who is uh, also, you have been uh, going through many uh, exits and, you know, many companies uh, along the way. And uh, so basically, you have been in the game for many years and seen both US and Asia's uh, startup ecosystems. So if we talk about, say, Singapore's startup ecosystem, we talk about, you know, advice for the, you know, current or, uh, you know, future entrepreneurs. So, like, where do you yourself, like, what do you think that has changed in these startup ecosystems over the years? And uh, beside I me, mean, besides the startup fever, I guess, that we're kind of experiencing nowadays. And uh, the second thing is that, like, where are the opportunities now? Or where are the opportunities in a few years 
and what could I or should I do if I'd like to take advantage of it? Uh, that's a lot of topics. Let me see if I can uh, remember in my forgetful <laughs> professor mind. So, yeah, so, let's, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> maybe we would break it so down first. I need, I yeah, need so to share with you some, yeah. some funny stories about uh, my so-called exits. Okay, uh, I haven't talked to, spoken about the story, um, probably not publicly, but um, my very first, and this is related to, to being a woman and a CEO of a startup company, so it's relevant to this audience. It also is relevant to the decades of change that has come about. So I was an entrepreneur in um, 1995 in Singapore, a tech entrepreneur, one of the few software companies um, back then. Um, and we were venture invested. And I still remember um, to this day that the lead venture capitalist, who shall remain nameless, um, he, you know, he was brainstorming with me in one of the meetings, um, you know, because we were doing well, we had revenue, we were growing, and all those wonderful things. Um, and I was sort of a novice um, in this whole VC entrepreneur relationship. So I did not manage that relationship well whatsoever. But I remember this conversation very vividly to this day. This was 20 something years ago. We were in this meeting and we were talking about the growth of the company, how to scale it up, how to take it to the next level because we were doing well. Uh, and to go for a second round of funding, third round of funding. And he distinctly said to me, and, and I almost jumped out of my seat, he said, and we're gonna write, we should raise a second round of funding and uh, then we should get an American CEO. And I paused. By the way, I'm, I'm an American citizen. So I said, excuse me, uh, I'm American. And he, he said to me, oh, not you, Virginia. He, and so he, he meant, in other words, he didn't quite say it. He meant a white male American CEO. Okay, this was 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, you can get away saying bogus things like this, okay? But not anymore. Today, if you were to say something like that, um, you know, you, you'll get the whole community come down on you. Um, <laughs> but this happened literally 20 years ago. It was in, you know, I was in, in the room and he actually said, no, no, not you, Virginia, dismissing. Um, so anyway, so I just thought I'd share that. Um, story with you to illustrate how much has changed in the 20 years. Now, granted, we still don't have enough um, women in the startup community at the CEO level. We have lots of us in the um, CXO, in, in, in the boardroom as co-founders, but really as CEO, there's still probably you can count them in, in your you know, two hands for the prominent startups in, in Singapore. So we still got a ways to go, but we've come a long ways in the ecosystem. Um, so that's to share with you that we made a lot of progress. Uh, in terms of opportunities um, in the future, and by the way, um, and I really like what you said about um, the whole uh, who you want to uh, invest in, in with Entrepreneur First, um, because that's just amazing, investing in people. So. Let me segue into that and tell you the next opportunity. Firstly, to encourage all of you and to tell you that if you are aspiring to be an entrepreneur, in my world, you've already uh, ascending into what I call level three state of being, okay? So I'm gonna explain what that is, okay? There's, to me, I've, I've gotten very philosophical lately. You know, I've been reading a lot of Confucius and Lao Tzu and all that. And I've come to this conclusion that uh, we as humans are always in pursuit of something, okay? And level one human beings are, are, the, are the people we don't want to be. That's the, in pursuit of hedonistic desires and all that. They're very selfish people, all okay? right? That level two, are, most of us are there, okay, in pursuit of happiness, okay? And the level three is what we call in pursuit of meaning in your life. So entrepreneurs who are not in pursuit of money, they just want to do something meaningful, they're already landing in, in, in level three. So kudos to, to all of you. All right, so now let's talk about meaning. Um, so back to your point, to get PhDs, and uh, not everybody in the room is a PhD, right? And not everybody in the room can, you know, partner with a PhD to do some deep tech and um, solve, you know, cancer or, or something with a magic potion. 
So what are you going to do as an entrepreneur? You, you, know, you can code, um, you can do cool technical things, but you're, you're, you don't have truly deep tech, right? So what I'm going to advise you to do is practice some futuristic thinking uh, in terms of looking at mega trends, okay? I'm currently um, uh, driving for this when I'm, uh, I'm helping with an incubator, uh, SIM. Uh, it's called Platform E. And what I'm going to do is pursue a, what I call food track, F-O-O-D, food, stuff we eat. Um, and I think well, there's a lot of opportunities in food um, for Singapore entrepreneurs. And I don't mean go open a restaurant. That's really tough. Okay, don't, do, don't go around. I don't want you to go out and run out and open a, a, a hawker cent or anything like that. Okay? But I think there's a lot of opportunities in food in Singapore that we haven't explored. And food is one area that technology cannot completely disrupt and remove. We still got to eat. Okay? But what we can do with technology is to add, enhance its value. So things like, um, uh, well, in the food retail space, there's a lot of delivery and, and all the interesting things. But there's also the middle layer, what I call food science, that you can consider. Um, and then uh, food agri-tech. And just because you're, just, you're coding doesn't mean you can't add value there. So uh, you know, I want to encourage you to think about these things. Um, we have moved on in our world to where we are very focused on health uh, and well-being and nutrition. Um, your health is directly correlated to the food you put in your body. In case you didn't know that, you just heard it. Okay. So, <laughs> so, and I think that realization is going to be far more um, widespread as the years go by. Uh, particularly um, with the, the uh, animal protein and processed food, what does that mean to your body? So I would encourage you to look at opportunities in food as applied with uh, using technology. Um, and it's kind of, of a white space right now in Singapore. And we are a foodie nation, so it's a good place to go. So that's the one area that I could suggest you go to. Other areas would be other opportunities and mega trends that you may feel passionate about. So I'll, I'll pause here. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, so then because we, we only have, uh, you know, not too long anymore. So uh, just going uh, to uh, Anna and um, uh, just a quick question uh, for you because, you know, eventually, you know, we're talking about entrepreneurship, but we also have, uh, you know, title in this uh, panel, which is like business without gender. So, and then I, I love your t-shirt actually. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've seen many of uh, my friends and founders wearing that. So could you just share a little bit about, you know, why you felt that you, you need to, uh, you know, do this? Okay, so, so the t-shirt, yeah. uh, it's um, a f female founder, but the female is slashed. Um, it's actually just a playful tongue in cheek, um, you know, because every time you go to a panel, people ask, how does it feel to be a female founder? Uh, or, or people always ask, why is this female CEO? And, and, and the question is, why must you put a female in front, right? Because when it's a male, you never say, hey, this is Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs is a male CEO. They are always called CEOs. But when it's a female, then you always highlight that. So a few of us, uh, were a few of the, so I'm, there are a few female entrepreneurship uh, groups and we use uh, we hang out a lot and so this is one of the things that we used to joke about so we just made the t-shirt for fun yeah but I think in in terms of female entrepreneurship I I don't think that I mean people always ask do is it is there a difference I don't think so in fact I think if you want me to be honest I think um, I find that women have a lot more advantages than men um, so it, it's not I mean there are discrimination Right, there are times that it's harder being a female. So when I pitch to VCs, a lot of them, I mean, it's very common and I'm sure, you know, some of you will find it. They will always ask, you know, you already, well, they never really specifically say that I'm old, but you're like, okay, you're already like, I'm, I'm 32. So they always say, you're already so old. I have met a guy who said, you're already so old. Um, you know, you're going to be left on the shelf. You're over the hill. Are you sure you don't want to get married? No, I, I'm not joking. I wrote it on my Facebook two years ago. It's quite funny. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, and then or they will say like, don't you want to have kids? And I mean, yeah, so I think 
most women will face this. Yeah, but I, I do believe, my personal belief is that women have it. There are a lot of advantages of being a female founder. So I always say that, you know, if as an entrepreneur, you use a lot of whatever resources you can to try to get your business or, uh, ahead, right? I mean, within, moral, within morally acceptable grounds. Um, so, so for example, if you ever need uh, an advice, uh, okay, like for me, personally, I found it very, really, really hard because all I know is finance. So when I started this and I don't have as much experience as the other panelists, I was struggling. I was really struggling. I really didn't know what I was doing. I slept like four hours every day and I was just... If, if you wanted to quit at one point, I want to quit every single day. So you, you try to ask people who have been there. And one thing I realized, okay, so for, for female, it's so easy to ask for help, you know, because you go to LinkedIn and you approach, let's say, any business leaders. And because you're a female, I can assure you that 70% of the time, you will get the meeting. If you ask somebody today, you know, let's say I approach Professor Ching Wu or Anne Mary, right? They will most probably, because you're a female, you want to help each other. But if you, and you approach a guy, and most probably the guy will also say yes. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but if you are a male founder and you approach a female, the first thing the female is going to say thing is like, um, okay, this is a bit weird. Why are you asking me out, right? And if a male asks another male, it's also not as easy. So I always feel that yeah, being a female founder is actually much more advantageous. I mean, that's me, and I'm an optimist at heart. You want to comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> oh God, it makes my blood boil. Um, I think what I find a really helpful framework and which makes me feel less like a total imposter as in who gave that girl that job. Um, it's stats, guys. Like, statistically, we are so much less likely to even up, end up in this room here today because our entire lives, the entire society has been telling us to, you know, not study certain subjects. Please don't be ambitious. Be likable and nice and get married and people will love you for having girlfriends and wearing pink things and not wanting to change the world. And here you are. And genuinely, for me, like, as an investor, but also when I like hire people and when I meet people in general, like um, for women to stand up to everything that the world tells us, you and me, um, to not do what we do every day, if you have a guy and um, a woman in a same like level position, it probably means the woman is better, as in to get there, she has to be. I find that such a like powerful realization. So next time you interview candidates and they're like equally good, you think, but one is a woman, that probably means the woman is better. <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> um, and that also means that like I find it really hard to not like downplay the things that I do because it doesn't make me more likable when I say, yeah, I did you know, go to Cambridge and study physics and got a big job, and I'm fucking great at my job. Sorry for the swearing. Um, but you know what? Uh, because that makes me like the arrogant, weird Dutch woman. But, you know, I am. And I think it's really important for all of us here today that we start owning up to our achievements because I think that's the first step in true equality. I'm so happy to be in this panel anyways. <laughs> this is so much fun. Um, okay, so we, we're running out of time, um, unfortunately, but one last question, right? Can I? Yes? Can? Okay. One small, so very, very, yes, small one, I promise. Uh, it's going to be so fast. Um, so what's the uh, best and the worst thing about being an entrepreneur? Quickly, uh, if you could just like summarize in few words. I think the best and worst at the same is the same thing. You are always confronted with new experiences and through those new experiences you learn a lot about yourself and that sometimes is scary and sometimes it's good so to me that's the embodiment of entrepreneurship there's nothing like entrepreneurship that forces you 
to truly understand who you really are until you walk through that journey and confront the thousands of decisions you have to make and the courage whether or not you have it to make it and whether or not you make the right ones. And that's where you sleep with yourself every night with the decisions you make and you really get to know yourself as the best and the worst rolled into one. Wow, okay, they just blew me away. <laughs> um, I definitely agree. This is probably the best answer. Uh, a more like, but, but I think my answer is really casual. Uh, it's really all about having lots of fun. And starting out really provides you with a whole level of fun that you can never get at work. And I think that everyday enjoyment uh, is what keeps me going, um, honestly. And you will never get as much fun. Okay, you get so much fun that you sometimes might get heart attacks. <laughs> that's, that's the truth of it. Uh, the bad thing about being an entrepreneur is that you, because you're constantly in this kind of reality distortion view, uh, no one really understands what you're doing. You will be very misunderstood by your closest friends, your families, who don't really know why you're doing this. Maybe if they're not acquainted with the idea of entrepreneurship, they'll tell you just to get a job, which is very discouraging. So um, I feel like being an entrepreneur, you really need support. And if you don't have that, it, it really gets tough. Uh, so yeah, that's probably the worst thing that can happen. I think for me, um, sometimes I ask, I work seven, I mean, I work every day. So sometimes at 4 p.m. in my office where there's no air con and everyone's having fun, they soft it out beside my office and they're having parties. I ask myself, what kind of choices have I made in my life to end up here? <laughs> um, and I mean, I came from the banking world and it's a very snazzy world with a lot of money and comforts. You know, we used to get, go to all the nicest restaurants all paid for, right? And, and now every time I go to an event, the first thing I do is to go to the food and no, please don't talk to me until I have eaten, yeah. Um, but uh, I think, so the worst part is always thinking of what's next. I think for me, it's, it's, it's always like, I just feel like I'm failing every day and you learn to cope with that feeling of being a failure every day because no matter what you do, it's just not good enough. Um, but the best thing about it is that despite having despite being on the other side of the fence where um, you know, I could buy anything I want, I, you know, we could afford anything I want and I never found something that I had now, which is a sense of purpose and I think for a lot of us, money is very important. Uh, for a lot of us, having a career and achieving is very important but the thing that makes you jump up every single morning, being excited about your day is a sense of purpose of helping and making an impact to others. So for me, that's the best thing. I, th I think those are all great answers. I think for me, the hardest bit is that you can't like switch off. As in, I think when I was at Goldman, even if I would like get home at whatever, 2 a.m., at least then at 2 a.m. I could like go to bed and sleep. And now I will like wake up at 2 a.m. and think, oh my God, I have to, oh my God. Um, so it's just like the relentlessness of how constant it all is. Um, the best thing is I'm quite megalomaniac and I think sort of the amplitude of what you can do in the world will never be as big as when you are a founder. As in if you genuinely like think it's really fun and like get a lot of purpose from a certain thing, I think starting a company is the way to do it. Okay, thanks everybody, and thank you. Uh, thanks to the audience as well. Wow, thank you so much, Virginia, Chingru, Anne-Marie, Anna, and Jenny for an amazing conversation on stage. Uh, running a business sure isn't easy. Wow, thank you for uh, sharing your honest thoughts and the challenges that you went through. Oh, they're taking a selfie. Um, challenges they went through in their journeys. I did see a lot of nodding heads in the room. They are doing, they're doing several takes, different poses. See if you can get your face in the crowd. Um, and I do hope that inspired you as much as it inspired me.